Good morning. Good morning. We're going to get started. So if you'd like to take a seat. I hope everybody uh, got some rest last night because we have a full day today. We have uh, two messages this morning and then a potluck and bowling and then come back for two more messages. So I hope everybody's ready for the, the full day today. So let's uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for this time where we can gather together in fellowship and uh, we just uh, kind of a real privilege to be able to meet together and uh, and uh, just a time where we can just celebrate and worship you and uh, discover more of who you are. We just pray that you would be with uh, this morning, uh, Ivan and Kenneth, as they bring us this morning messages and just pray your spirit would be upon them and speak through them. We ask that you would uh, prepare our hearts for that and that we can be attentive and really listen to what you want to speak into our hearts this morning. Um, so let us be receptive, Lord, and uh, we just pray that you would speak your word, that your presence would be here and help us to grow and uh, help us to be a better disciple. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to turn it over to Stephanie and the music team. <laughs> start out with hymn number 361 in the red book and and our song set this morning is heaven bound so let's stand and stand and sing with us this world is not my home
Good morning. Good morning. Hope everybody rested well from yesterday. As Derek said, hope you're looking forward for a busy morning, afternoon, and evening, and look forward to the fellowship. And uh, we have a special thing that I talked with teacher Erica. And so for those kids and kids that would like to participate, they're going to have kids church this morning. So if you guys would like to follow Erica, whoever would like to go up upstairs, uh, please go ahead at this time. All right. So this morning we have Mr. Kenneth Mickey. I haven't seen Kenneth probably since pre-COVID and uh, he's been a part of the camp for many years, coming with his brother. And it's great to have his wife here this morning as well. So I'm looking forward to hearing Brother Kenneth Mickey. He's from Reno, Nevada. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think, did I click it the right way? Maybe? We're going to find out. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Thank you for being here. We are very excited and glad to be here, and I'm glad that you guys are putting this rally together. Thank you very much. It's been a long time since I've been up here. Like uh, Mr. Brainerd said, it's uh, from uh, BC times before COVID. And so definitely <laughs> glad to get back. And uh, I'm glad to see the church moving forward and, and recovering and, and pushing forward and encouraging one another. And it's definitely a good, good thing. And I'm glad to be here this morning. And I hope you're glad to be here as well. Couple dates if you'd like to write them down. We've got a couple things coming up in Reno, Nevada there on September the 1st through the 4th. It's actually just a couple hours north of Reno, but we have a family camp from September 1st through the 4th. So if you'd like to be part of that, I'm gonna be sending up a flyer here. Um, you guys are welcome to come up, camp out out there. There's a campground that you can uh, bring a trailer or a tent or if you're saying, oh, I don't know about camping, I just want to be a part of it, you can come out. There's a hotel that's about a half hour away or so in a town called Alturas, so you can stay there and camp that way. Um, but come on out and uh, be a part, if you'd like, to our family camp, September 1st through the 4th. It's over Labor Day weekend there. Another date to remember, if you'd like to be part of it, is September 22nd through 23rd. We are having a ladies' rally, so if you'd like to participate in that, uh, come on down to Reno, Nevada there for a ladies' rally. Uh, it's the second year for that, and we'll be sending some flyers up for that as well. And then if you'd like to also write this date down, though it's not as important to some people, but it's really important my wife and I, January 3rd, my wife is expecting. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're back there. I knew. I knew. <laughs> All right. If you want to turn your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14 this morning, and uh, here we are looking at being faithful as a disciple, and, and this morning specifically, I want to ask you a question. How do we prepare to be a faithful disciple of Christ? How do we prepare to be a faithful disciple of Christ? How many of you feel like you're already prepared for anything that may come against you? How many of you feel like you're prepared for the storms of life? How many of you feel like you're prepared to follow Christ faithfully till death? Amen. How many of you feel like we could step up our game in the preparation? This morning, I want to look over here in Matthew, the 14th chapter for just a minute. If you would turn with me over to Matthew, the 14th chapter. And as we begin reading in verse number 22. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22. Please stand as we read our text this morning. Here it says in Matthew 14, 22, it says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And he, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. 
Now when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went into them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, expect, saying, it is a ghost. And immediately they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And then Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And then they got in the boat, the wind ceased. And verse number 33, and when those who were in the boat came and worshiped him saying, truly, thou art the son of God. Let's pray as we begin this morning. Father in heaven, we're thankful that we're able to be here this morning. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the church and we're thankful that we get to be a part of your kingdom, your church. We're thankful that we're able to gather here this morning and study your word and be able to exhort ourselves and look at this example and see that we can allow our faith to grow when we focus on you. But please help us be humble this morning. Help us to be honest with ourselves as we examine our life to see are we really focusing on you? Are we allowing our faith in you to grow? or we become distracted by everything that's going on in the world. Please help us this morning as we study your word. Help us to gain a deeper understanding and help us to go out of here encouraged and excited, building up other faithful Christians. Please give us that strength and that boldness this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing and you may be seated. Here we are in Matthew, the 14th chapter, and the question is, how does one prepare to be a faithful disciple of Christ? This is a really neat parable here. Not a parable, I'm sorry. This is a really neat story here of Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus leaves something so great, leaves something so wonderful, and tells his disciples to go get in the boat. Now, this story is also recorded in John, the sixth chapter, and what were they leaving? They were leaving a great big dinner party, if you want to call it that. There was a feeding of over 5,000 people, or, or as it says, 5,000 men. And so does that mean that there was more women and children in that mix? And maybe the number was higher than that by two or three times. How many people were there? I don't know, but it was a big, big feeding and a big gathering there. A lot of people were there. John records this in John chapter 6 and verse 15, and he says, When Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him with force and make them their king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. It's interesting that John adds that. That Jesus could see through the 5,000 and could see through the feeding and see through the great multitude that had flocked to him and realize the motive and realize the mission of the, of the crowd and realize their desire was not to make him king of kings and lord of lords, but to make him king as a food ministry director because that fits their social narrative. Hey, Jesus could feed us. Our town would never go without food. He could heal the sick. We wouldn't have any lame. We, he could clean up the streets. I mean, look, we need this guy to be our mayor. We need this guy to be our whatever it is. And that's what they were after. But they weren't after his teaching. They weren't after his way of salvation. They weren't interested in following him. And Jesus realized their mission and their motive. And when they says, when he realized they wanted to come take him with force, he departed again to the mountain by himself. Here, Jesus had just fed the 5,000 with two loaves, or five loaves, I'm sorry, five loaves and two fish. Just a little bit, and it spread out. Last week, I was at a camp in Kentucky, and there they had a big old fish fry. But there was a whole lot more than two fish. I think there was several hundred fillets, and it was able to feed like 30, 40 people. But here, there were five loaves and two fish, a real miracle. And Jesus was able to distribute that 
and showed them that he was the Son of God. Then why did Jesus depart? Then why did Jesus tell his disciples to get in the boat? It's interesting that Jesus understood their agenda and he understood. And so without any violence, without any, without a fight, in one unhesitating move, he saves his disciples, avoids the wrong crown, and doesn't make anybody particularly angry. I mean, after all, the picnic was over and it was time for the people to go home. There he is, sending his disciples into the boat, and he departs to the mountain to pray. Now, before we start this morning, before we get into how we need to prepare, let's take for just a second and let's study the example of Jesus. He could have been ministering to over 5,000 people, and what does he choose to do? Go talk to God. There were, there were over 5,000 people that wanted a, a, a little bit of time in Jesus' schedule. And Jesus said, I've got something a little more important. How many people are pressing you right now? What's your schedule look like? Work, school, home, you go in and it's like, I just don't have any time. I just don't have any time. You need to stop and make time to talk to God. To get refocused. To understand His will. To be able to gain a, a, a more more faith and gain a deeper understanding of God and allow your strength to grow. Prayer is powerful. And we as God's people need to be seeking opportunities to talk to God. Why would we as God's people miss out on one of the most powerful tools that God has given us and just set it aside and say, we don't need that in fighting the devil. We don't need that tool. We don't need that asset. Come on, folks, we need to devote time to prayer and real time to talk to God and seek him. It's interesting on how much time Jesus devoted to this. Here it says in verse number 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Verse number 23, and when he had come and sent the multitudes away, he went up onto the mountain by, this, by himself to pray, and now when evening came, he was alone there. Now, verse number 25 says, Now when the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them. The fourth watch would have been somewhere around three in the morning, from my best understanding. He went from just as it's getting dark to about three in the morning just to go talk to God. How much time do we dedicate to prayer? Oh, a good, solid 30 seconds before every meal. How much time do we dedicate talking to God, Almighty God, who can give us the strength, who can give us the direction, who can help us understand His work and His will? How much time are we dedicating? Jesus found it important that no matter how many people were seeking Him, that no matter how many people were trying to attack His schedule and to throw Him off course, He needed some direction and some communication with God. And we as God's people need to maintain that communication because... How are we going to all of a sudden build it when we find ourselves in the middle of a storm without God standing right next to us? We need to build that communication right now. You can think about some of the things that maybe Jesus was praying about. Maybe he was praying about the wickedness of the enemy and the worldliness of the crowd. Maybe he's praying about that. I mean, they had just beheaded his cousin, John the Baptist. And there, there's 5,000 people wanting to put the wrong crown on his head. Maybe he's praying about the weakness of his, of his disciples. He's like, these 12 guys just don't get it. Everything I do, and they get a little closer, they're getting better. But they're just not ready to take the ministry. They're just not ready to start the church yet. Maybe he's praying about them and saying, maybe, God, help me understand how to help their faith grow. I don't know what it was. Maybe he was simply waiting on God. Maybe he was just keeping communication open. Maybe he was getting a little bit of focus. I don't know what it was. It doesn't say. But we need to make sure prayer is important in our life. A couple things to remember when we're talking about prayer and prayer in our own life. Four things to remember. God is present and involved in our life 
even when he seems to be deaf or on an extended period of absence. God is present and God is involved in our lives. Second, God's timing is perfect. Even when he appears catastrophically late. How about this? Your arms are too short to box with God. So don't try. Don't argue with him. Let's talk to him. Let's work with him. For reasons that are impossible to explain, we as God's people are incredibly precious to him. Number five, one of the evidences of emotional and spiritual maturity is the ability to overrule feelings and govern them with behavior, with the intellect and the will. People often place too much confidence in feelings and too little on the promises of God. Now, as we're looking at this and we're looking at the example of Jesus, remember to stop and pray because he's there waiting to listen to you. How do we, as God's people, prepare to be a faithful disciple? We looked at his example. The first thing that I want to look at this morning is prepare to lead the multitudes. How do we prepare as God's people to be a faithful disciple? The first thing we need to do is to prepare to leave the multitudes. Now, when, we, when I say that, I'm not saying to ignore evangelism, but what I'm saying is to ignore the distractions and the things that will pull us away from God and his will. A lot of times we seek confidence in numbers and we seek that and, and popularity isn't always right. What's right isn't always popular, but what is popular doesn't get us into heaven. What is popular doesn't mean that we're necessarily following God's will and God's word. It may be for a time, it may not be. What is right does. And so we need to take a close examination in our life to see are we following God or are we just going along with the flow? The problem is, as you can watch the river and everything, the flow goes downhill. But God's got a purpose and direction, and he's heading upwards towards God. Where are we going? We need to prepare to lead the multitudes. Now, when you think about this, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus helps, him, helps the people understand that there is a wide net, a wide way, and a narrow way. And, and obviously, just going along with the multitude doesn't necessarily mean you're getting into heaven. Because broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to, say it with me, life. Eternal life. And so which way are we going? But now when we look at this passage here in Matthew 14, we don't have to go outside of that passage. We can look at right here and see three, things and three reasons why we need to prepare to leave the multitudes. The first is your focus is not on Jesus when you're with the multitude. Your focus is not on Jesus when you're focused away from Jesus. Here, they had just fed all of these, the, the 5,000. I mean, Peter and the other disciples there, they've got the baskets, they're going around. Would you like some fish? Would you like some bread? Would you like some fish? Jesus leaves, and if the disciples stayed there with the crowds away from Jesus, they would have been hailed as a hero. They'd have probably been there and be like, hey, those are the guys that fed me. Do it again, do it again. And pretty soon that wears off when the disciples can't do it again. Because Jesus wasn't there. But they would have been focused on maintaining that popularity. They'd have been focused on maintaining that status with the crowd. And where's Jesus? Off seeking God's will. Jesus said it's time that we need to go and we need to do the will of God. It's time that we as God's people not just focus on what's popular not just focus on what's appeasing to the crowd, but focus on Jesus and God and his word. Amen? Amen? It's time that we start looking for that. Second thing is, your faith doesn't grow when you're not with Jesus. Your faith doesn't grow if you're not with Jesus. He said, let's go. Let's get in the boat. If they would have remained there with the multitude, they'd have felt comfortable 
there would have been no test of faith and they would have been distracted. But here, they were able to get on that boat and realize it's either life or death without Jesus. They got scared so bad. They needed God. And sometimes we need our faith to grow. And we need to be able to seek God and understand it's either life or death, not just a, a food ministry. It's not just this. It's not just that. It's not just appeasing people. It's life or death without God. And we need to put our faith in him and seek him and allow our faith to grow. What does it say in James chapter one and verse two? My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various. When you're being comfortable sitting with the crowd that's away from Jesus. Is that what it says? No. Our faith grows, as it says in James, when we're seeking him and endure through that. The third reason, why do we need to prepare to leave the multitudes? And this is simple. Because Jesus left. If Jesus isn't there, that's not where we need to be. If Jesus isn't there in your marriage, that's not where you need to be. If Jesus isn't there, that's not where we need to be at work. If Jesus isn't there in that joke, that's not what we need to be saying. If Jesus isn't there in that, the, those cuss words or the lies or the whatever it is, that's not what we need to be saying. If Jesus isn't there in the bar, that's not where we need to be. If Jesus isn't there in the you fill in the blank in the home and the whatever it is, we need to look for Jesus. Amen. There, was a, there was a really neat older lady in the congregation in the Reno, and I, I think she's passed away like 10, 15 years ago. Every time we had a new Christian, somebody baptized in the water of grace of baptism, risen to walk in the newness of life, we have a time of encouragement. And she would raise her hand and say, and it was real simple, but it was so meaningful. And she'd just say, whatever you go, or I'm sorry, wherever you go and whatever you do, if you can't take Jesus, don't. Something so simple, but so meaningful and, and so relevant to the Christian life. Whatever you do, wherever you go, if you can't take Jesus, don't. Just don't. Let's go with Jesus. Jesus said, go get in the boat. Hey, Jesus told us, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptize them and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. Jesus, Jesus told us to help grow our faith and grow the church. That's what, that's what he said. And so when we're act, acting outside of his will, that's not where Jesus is. Where's Jesus in your life today? Where's God in your life? Where's, where's his word? I don't know if this is necessarily 100% a product of COVID or not because it kind of was around before COVID and it just incentivized it and brought it to light. But a lot of people have traded out God for religious things. The godly people, Christian people, the one that Christ died for, the ones that are part of his church are very comfortable in reading every religious book and not cracking open their Bible. They're, they're very comfortable in downloading, sharing, saving, pinning, tweeting, posting, whatever it is, religious quotes, sayings, whatever it is, and never bring up a scripture verse. It may be a song, but not a scripture verse. How about, how about they're, they're very comfortable in associating with godly people Oh, they'll meet them for dinner. They'll go different places. They'll go fishing. They'll go whatever it may be and not meet around the Lord's table on the Lord's day. Folks, you can't substitute godly people for God. We need godly people. We need the church to come together, but we need to come together around God, not popularity, not around the multitudes, around Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so when he says it's time to leave the multitudes, it's time to leave because Jesus was ready to leave. And Jesus was about to do the will of God. The first thing that we need to do is we need to prepare to leave. Jesus says you may need to leave your mother, your father, your family, your friends, those closest near you. If they're not helping you grow in Christ, it's time to not seek popularity. It's not time to seek comfort in those nearby. It's time to follow God. And that's when 
our faith will grow. Second thing that we can do to prepare to be a faithful disciple is prepare for a storm. Prepare for a storm. Now, some people, and we need to debunk this real quick. Some people can look at this passage and say, see, Jesus wasn't in the boat, so the only time that you'll have a storm in your life is when you're not with Jesus. No, ah, wrong answer. <laughs> you can be doing everything right and there will be a storm in your life. Now, you could be doing everything wrong and incentivizing and building up the consequences of your own actions, of course. But here you can be just living the Christian life, being faithful to God, and a storm will arise. The disciples right here were right where Jesus told them to be. They were right there and a storm arose. How about the other time when Jesus was on the boat sleeping with them? How much closer could they get? How much closer could they follow Christ with him right there? And a storm arose. The point is, storms will arise. The question is, are you prepared for the storm? Or in the middle of the storm, are you going to stop and blame God? It's time for us to be prepared because God can help us be prepared. God wants us to be prepared. And God's here to help us through the storm. Prepare for a storm. Storms can come in any shape, size. The winds can blow in different directions. It can happen within your family. It can happen when in any different aspect are we going to be prepared for the storm that's about to hit our life. What do we need to do? How can we prepare right now? There's a couple things we need to identify. Who God is. How is he going to communicate with us? And what's his will for us? Pretty simple to understand this, but there's three things we need to identify. Who God is, how is he going to communicate, and what's his will for us? You see, Peter was out there on the sea, and earlier, not even, not even 24 hours earlier, he's walking around handing out baskets of fish and bread to everybody. Do you think at that time he's thinking about, oh, there's going to be a storm when I get in the boat. He doesn't even know he's getting in the boat. He doesn't even know that God's gonna have him get in the boat. He doesn't even know that's coming. And right now, it may be think, you might be sitting here thinking, hey, things are good. We are in a rally right now, surrounded by God's people. We've got God's word right in front of us. We just prayed, we just read his word. We're excited. We've got a great family of brothers and sisters in Christ encourage us encouraging us on and you don't realize that in 24 hours or whatever it is there's going to be a storm that will scare you to death that you don't know what's going to happen you don't know what the outcome is and you need to right now when times are good identify who God is and not just say oh I think he's he's somebody great you need to identify him as Lord and Savior of your life that's the only thing you identify him as anything else, and you're in a wreck. The people there in John 6 and Matthew 14, the 5,000, they want to identify him as the food ministry director. And then a little bit later, he started teaching there in John 6, and they got upset. And they said, well, just stop being a good teacher. We'll, just, we'll take him and identify him as a good teacher. They didn't want to identify him as Lord and Savior. And they didn't want to identify that the place we could find his communication is in his word. A lot of people are looking for a feeling from God. Feelings come and go. Feelings are subjective. Oh, I just felt something in my soul that I know God is here. That was Taco Bell. <laughs> I, just, I just know, I just know. Is it, is it match up with God's word? It is, can you find it in God's word? You see, there Peter was in the middle of a storm and Peter being a fisherman was scared. This is not the first time that Peter was on the water. I mean, he was familiar with maybe either that boat or a boat similar. Peter was familiar with that water or water similar. He, was, he had been in things. He had been in places that had scared him before. But this time, 
It says the wind was boisterous and they became afraid. Peter couldn't look around and identify God by feeling him because he felt the wind. Peter couldn't identify him by by looking out and, and just seeing God because he saw a ghost. How did he identify God? By his word. Folks, you're going to be surrounded in a storm that you may not feel that God's there. You may not see God working immediately. And the only thing that's going to be able to guarantee and show you that God is working and God is there is by his word. And what did his word say? Come, I'm right here. Do not be afraid. God's saying that today too. Draw closer to him, not push farther away. Draw closer to him by his word. Peter, looking out, seeing a ghost, 3 a.m., in the boat going up like this, wave coming up. He probably caught a glimpse. Maybe one of the disciples like, I think I see something out there. And they probably said, ah, you had too much leftover fish. <laughs> ah, we need to quit eating that fish. That fish is like 12 hours. It hasn't been in the refrigerator. Ah, it, it went away. A wave came up. It's still there. It's coming closer. And they identified him as a ghost. But when God spoke, they knew who it was. When Jesus spoke, they knew. When we dig into God's word, but yet we're not drawing closer to him and we don't understand his word and we've been foreign to it, we may misidentify it. <laughs> this is scary stuff. That's why today you need to dig into God's word. That's why today we need to be reading it on a regular basis. So it doesn't look scary and it doesn't look like a ghost when we see God's word. So how do we prepare to be a faithful disciple? First thing is we prepare to lead the multitudes. Second, prepare for a storm. That storm will come. I don't know what it'll look like, but one thing we can do is be prepared and endure with God's help. Third thing this morning is we need to prepare to let the master of the sea be the master of your life. We need to prepare to let the master of the sea be the master of your life. Take a look here at Matthew the 14th chapter. Matthew chapter 14 and it says there a little bit further on. And it says in verse number 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying be of good cheer. It is I do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said Lord. And if it's you come to me, or I'm sorry, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to see. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. And verse number 33, very important, truly, or those, then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him saying, truly, thou art the son of God. Prepare to let the master of the sea be the master of your life. He's there. He wants to help you. He's there to save you. He's there to provide the way of salvation. He's there to provide you his word. He's there to provide you strength. He's there to provide you peace. In the time of storm. Do not be afraid. It is I. Now notice. Jesus didn't just remove the storm right then. He let them endure. So he could let them obey him. And there we can see him. Saying truly. Thou art the son of God. Peter identifies him correctly. And says Lord command me. Are we ready to be commanded by the Lord? Are we ready to be reaching out to him. And seeking him in our life today. James chapter 4 reminds us that we need to draw near to God. But to do that, we've got to humble ourselves. Peter could have been like, oh, I'm a fisherman. I got this under control. I'll just get another oar. I'll just get a bigger anchor. I'll just get, we're going to manage. I don't know about this ghost that's coming towards me. We laugh at that and mock at that. But how many times do we do that in our Christian life? With Jesus so close to us, 
Rather than drawing to him or rather than seeking him and his advice, we're like, I got this, I got this. We, 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 we got this. I, 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 I don't need to pray as much. Did I? I got this. I got this. While their family falls apart. I, I got this. Well, while, while things at work are struggling. Why, well, I got this. Well, we don't know what to do with our kids. Why, well, I got this. Well, we don't know what to do in situations. Peter didn't say that. Peter said, Lord, command me. And it's time for us to let the master of the sea, the one that's there, who has all strength and all power and all knowledge, reach out for us and give us some words to live by. Amen. Are we letting the master of the sea be the Lord master of our life? It takes humility. Because pride will get in the way. But pride doesn't float. Pride doesn't row for you. Pride doesn't swim for you. Pride will sink. Humble yourselves and, and let God lift you up. Now Peter gets out of the boat, of course, and here we are. This is the part we're real familiar with. He gets out of the boat, he walks out, takes a couple steps, and then takes a look around. This is, this is where he's never been before. He's been in a boat that's gone like this. He's been in a boat with the wind and the waves. But out on the water, he's never taken the step of faith like that. How many times when you're in a storm and you're out there and things are going on in different situations and different circumstances and you're like, I don't know. And then you get to a point that you're like, I've never been to this part. And you start looking around and it scares you because you realize I've never done this. I'm not going to be walking by being comfortable anymore. But the problem is when he did that, he took his mind and his focus off God. It says, and then he saw that the waves and the wind were boisterous and became afraid. But I'm thankful that there's a savior, that there's a master of the sea reaching his hand out for us today. Saying, come. And he can grab it. Now we sometimes find it real easy to criticize Peter. Even Jesus said, oh, you have little faith. So we look at Peter, who you have little faith. I want just, just for a second, put yourself in his sandals. Step out of the boat, away from the, the 11 other guys that you're real familiar with, and step out on some water that you've never stood on before. Now look over to your right, and you see that wave that's taller than you. And look over here and feel the wind pushing you the other way. What was that you were going to say to Peter? I'm not saying that it's justifiable to allow our faith to slack. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying we need to look at ourselves. Where's our faith? Because we're going to be put in situations. And we as God's people, when we decide we're going to be a disciple of him, it's going to be a hard road. But it's worth it if we endure. And I'm thankful that he had his hand. God had his hand reaching out to grab him and he's got his hand reaching out to grab us. Right then, when Peter started to sink, his fear replaced his faith. Don't let the fear of the circumstance or the situation replace your faith in God. Continue to reach for him. Over in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, in verse number two, it says, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse two, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy has set before us endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why does it say to look unto Jesus? Because in verse number three, it says, lest you become weary and discouraged. Why do we as God's people need to maintain our focus? It's because it's not just a mere taking our eyes off Jesus that brought in the fright and the failure. He took his mind off the Lord, turning his attention to the dangers that whirled around him. It was the distraction that fixed his mind on the hazards. It left him dizzy, fearful, and helpless. And at that moment, total unquestioning confidence in Jesus was replaced by dependence upon his own feeble powers. And there he is, too far from the boat to swim back and too far from the master to grab his hand. And there he began to sink. 
Folks, I want to encourage you today. Let's prepare to let the master of the sea be the master of our life. Let our faith grow in him. Let us focus on him. How do we do that? We do that by, by make, becoming a disciple of him. To become a disciple, we've got to put our faith in him. We've got to believe who he said he is. We've got to, we've got to understand his word is there for us. We've got to repent and change our life. And turn from, from the wickedness of the world and the wickedness of a, whatever that's going on and say, I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. We're going to confess him as Lord and Savior of our life and be immersed in the watery graves of baptism for the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit where we can be risen to walk in a new life following him with the help of the Holy Spirit. A disciple of his. If you've never let the master of the sea be the master of your life today, I encourage you today. Make today the day of salvation. But maybe you did that a long time ago. And like Peter, you've been with Jesus for a long time. And it's just that one situation that rocked your boat. That one situation that left you without a good firm foundation and a good firm footing. And there you are, frightened and scared. Put your eyes on Jesus. I want to encourage you today. Reach out for him. His hand's reaching for you. Let's be faithful disciples. How do we do it? We prepare to lead the multitude. We prepare for storms, and we prepare to let him be our master. Thank you. Let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to sing in the Red Hymn Book, page 666. 666, Jesus is coming soon. Sometimes are here, filling in hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear, now is at stake. guitar playing, that's when we'll gather back. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're one of the Mickey kids. Yes, I'm one of the Mickey kids. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. 
Oh, thank you very much. We're really excited. Well, she is. No, I'm just kidding. Oh,